Second Timothy for Beginners, this is lesson number three in that series, title of this lesson, Encouragement and Instruction. The main instruction, of course, remain faithful. Remain faithful, part two, started this uh, section last week, we're in Second Timothy chapter two, verses one to 13. So far, Paul has uh, greeted, he's prayed for, and he's encouraged Timothy, the young evangelist, to remain faithful and he kind of outlines the things that he wants him to remain faithful to. Remain faithful to his calling as an evangelist. Remain faithful to the message of the gospel. You know, keep that message pure. Remain faithful also to the teachings that he has received from Paul as his teacher and mentor. So Paul has articulated these things, not just re remain faithful in general, but specifically in these areas. So these were important reminders for this uh, young preacher who was dealing with various church issues and people, because issues don't come along by themselves, they're brought by people. So you, you're always dealing with people uh, at uh, Ephesus where Paul had sent him to carry out his ministry. So in the section that we're going to study today, Paul will add another area where Timothy needed to make sure that he remained faithful. He needed to remain faithful in service. Chapter two, verse one, he says, you therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. This section about service is a little longer than just verse one, it goes verse one to seven, but let's just read verse one for now. As a minister, Timothy's task was to minister or serve the church, and so Paul gives him four examples of service from which he could draw encouragement and understanding. So Paul refers to him affectionately as my son, and in this we sense you know, the ache of his heart, you know, the ache of heart that Paul had for this young man. Uh, you know, he had trained this young guy and had mentored, and uh, now this uh, young uh, preacher was facing the very hard and often painful work of ministry for himself. Paul wasn't next to him now, now he was on his own. And I see just in these few words, you know, the feeling that a father has, for example, when he drops a son off at the airport as the young man leaves for his first military duty station. I don't know if any of you have ever had that experience, but I have. Dropping off a son, dropping off a daughter, leaving for their first duty station, or it's, it's the love and pride and fear and nostalgia you know, for his little boy or little girl grown up, all wrapped up in one emotion. Or it's the, it's the catch in a mother's heart when her daughter announces her engagement. I'm sure many of you have had that experience. You know, mom is joyful, but at the same time, she's wistful and a little bit sad that their relationship will change forever and the future will now bring a mixture of happiness and hurt that all new brides and future mothers experience. So as a good Christian father figure, Paul does what Christian parents today would do. He commends Timothy to the grace of God found in Christ. You know, we say the same thing today, you know, sending our son off uh, to the military, 18 years old. You know. We didn't say we commend you to the grace of Christ Jesus, that's Paul. We said, we'll be praying for you, but that's kind of the same thing. In other words, he encourages Timothy to find and grow in the strength that comes from God's grace. That's the point. However, what and how one you know, what, what does one do to achieve this? You know, how do you grow strong in the grace? You, know, you read the words, you understand the individual words, but what does he mean by that? Be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Well, being strong in the grace of God means that one's strength to do one's work or deal with obstacles and trials or to endure spiritual, emotional challenges, that strength is derived from God's grace and not personal wisdom or personal strength or willpower. 
or the wisdom from below. The wisdom from below can be good to handle certain things. But many times in life, what we need is the wisdom from above. In another letter, Paul summarizes this idea, and I'll just switch over for a moment, where he says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Same idea here in Philippians. So Timothy has a, you know, a difficult ministry where he's at, and Paul reminds him to go to and depend on God for the physical and emotional and spiritual resources that he's going to need to survive and to succeed. Yes, I'll pray for you, but you yourself remember who and where the strength comes from. So now Paul provides, you know, following this exhortation, he provides four practical examples of those who succeed in their various areas of service. Remember he's encouraging, be faithful in service. Now he's going to give him four examples of people who succeed. The first one he mentions are teachers. He says, the things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses entrust these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. So Paul summarizes the, the material, the method, and the goal of his teaching all in one succinct verse. The material is the sum of instructions that he has received from Paul, from doctrine to application to Christian lifestyle. All of that information there, the things which you have heard from me, that's what he's talking about. The method is to focus on those who are faithful and worthy of being entrusted with the word of God. You know, Paul mentions faithful men because he wants Timothy to focus on training church leaders. That's the point here. Obviously he has to preach the gospel to the church, encourage, exhort, so on and so forth. But in this passage, He's telling them where to focus. Now this wouldn't mean that he didn't, as I say, preach and teach to the women in the church, for example, but he was to concentrate on leadership training as one of his priorities. The goal of his teaching ministry was that his students would not only be able to teach others the material, but would also train others to carry on this method of teaching and training into future generations, especially those selected for leadership. The leaders, listen, <laughs> if the leaders don't understand that they have to raise up a future generation of leaders, the followers are not going to do it. I mean, that's basic stuff. And that's what Paul is focusing on here. Yes. Teach the church, preach the church, admonish, instruct, absolutely, yes. But you also need to raise up a generation of leaders that'll pick up after you and carry on into the next generation. That's the secondary goal he's talking about. Another example of people who are faithful, he uses to teach that lesson, are soldiers. He says, suffer hardship with me as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No soldier in active service entangles himself in the affairs of everyday life so that he may please the one who enlisted him as a soldier. So the recent Secretary of Defense, General Mattis, he said in an interview that the main job of the military is to win wars, period. End of statement. Everything else, he says, is secondary, and every part of the military serves this one goal. You're an accountant, you're working in an office somewhere on the base or whatever, uh, yeah. Your goal is to do your accounting and to make sure the money is there and the resources are there so our army can win the war. That's the objective. Paul is saying exactly the same thing here. As a soldier in the kingdom, Timothy's task and goal was clear. Preach the gospel, plant and organize churches to repeat this cycle. And so as a young man, there would be many distractions within the church, you know, majoring in minors, as well as temptations outside the church. Timothy, young man, normal man, living in a pagan, immoral, sexually corrupt society. 
If he was to succeed in avoiding both traps, Timothy would have to stay focused on who he was, he was a preacher, and what he was sent to do, proclaim the gospel, teach the church to obey the commands of Christ, and train leaders to train others for service in the future. And just like a soldier, he's saying, stay fixated on your goal. Another example he uses, athletes. Verse five, he says, also if anyone competes as an athlete, he does not win the prize unless he competes according to the rules. So Paul has clearly alluded to the need, uh, uh, the type of work and necessity of staying focused in his service as a minister that Timothy has to, to do. By adding the example of an athlete, the apostle now adds the idea of how one does the work. He knows what to do, here it's how do you do that work? And so he selects the uh, example of an, an athlete, like an athlete who has to compete in a framework of rules in order to win legitimately, Timothy must teach and preach accurately what he has learned from Paul, not to mention that his life must also accurately reflect his teachings. Those are the rules. The rules are, and that's not just in any religious teaching, but the rules are you have to walk the walk. You can't just be teaching the stuff, but you yourself, it doesn't apply to you. That's, that's, you're breaking the rules there. The rule is the teacher has credibility if the teacher is at least living out the things that he teaches. You know, in the military thing, uh, Paul used to tell me, and those of you in the military probably know this, of course, but he says our, our DI, our drill instructor, you know, if we had to do a 20 mile hump, he did the 20 mile hump. He didn't get up and say, okay, everybody line up, okay, yeah, 20 miles, and I'll meet you at the end, and then got into a Jeep, you know, and then <laughs> drove to the end point, waiting for them with Kool-Aid. No, 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 no. Yeah, he was with them, he was, come on, let's go, let's go, he was ahead. So, you know, Paul is saying to Timothy, you know, this is this, like athletes, they play according to the rules. You can't just, you can't just talk, you got to walk the walk too. You know, hypocrites may be able to correctly teach the doctrine of Christ, but they won't survive the judgment of Christ. And then he uses a fourth example to encourage Timothy to a life of faithfulness, and that's farmers. He says the hardworking farmer ought to be the first to receive his share of the crops. Consider what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. So Paul's final example reminds Timothy that there is a reward attached to his service. The farmer is the first to profit from his labor and he does so at every harvest. The thing he works at and with is also the thing that rewards him. He eats from or what he plants and harvests. Very simple cycle that everyone understands. And so the reward analogy follows the same line of thinking. The teacher's reward is not his paycheck for teaching, it's the understanding that he gains from what he studies. That's the real reward. I mean, everybody's got to eat, obviously. But the reward of teaching is that the teacher is the one that learns the most. And those of you who have taught a Bible class from cradle row all the way to an adult class, you know exactly what I'm saying. You end up knowing more about the thing that you knew before and probably know more than the class that you're teaching. And that is a great reward. So this is, this is true for every teacher studying any subject. However, it is especially rich and rewarding for the one whose focus of study is God Himself through the study of God's word. Because God will bless and reward the student with understanding and knowledge of Himself. And this experience in, is in itself a genuine foretaste of heaven. You know, the way to taste heaven is to taste this. The more you know Him through the study of this, the more you get a glimpse of heaven, and that is a great reward. So Paul encourages Timothy to remain faithful in his service as an evangelist and teacher, and he provides four examples of service, teachers, soldiers, athletes, farmers, in order to emphasize the various challenges and features of faithful service. <clears throat> He then neatly bookends these uh, passages with two references to God's role in Timothy's ministry. In verse one, 
Paul encourages Timothy to look to God's grace, remember, I, to God's grace, in other words, God's provision and mercy, for the physical, emotional, and spiritual resources to carry out his ministry. In other words, don't look to your own strength, look to God. So he starts off by saying, look to God to provide strength and the ability to carry out your ministry. Then he gives four examples of different types of service to show you know, how people are, can be faithful in service. And then in verse seven, he reminds Timothy that the reward for preachers and teachers is a greater knowledge of God himself. So God enables you at the beginning and he rewards you at the end. And he is with you all the way through. So Paul's point is that God is the encourager and enabler at the beginning and he's the rewarder at the end. Paul adds an additional thought concerning the reward aspect of remaining faithful. This time he refers to himself and his work as the example. So he'd be the fifth example, all right? Chapter two, verses eight to 10, he says, remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, descendant of David, according to my gospel, for which I suffer hardship, even to imprisonment as a criminal. But the word of God is not imprisoned. For this reason I endure all things for the sake of those who are chosen, so that they also may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus, and with it eternal glory. So Paul briefly summarizes the climax of God's plan. Well, the climax of God's plan is res the resurrection of Jesus. And his experience, Paul's experience, as a faithful servant and teacher, and the good and bad results that he has experienced in his life. So he has suffered false accusations and imprisonment as a common criminal. It's one thing to be imprisoned as, a, as an objector or as an you know, objector of conscience, but he was, he was put in prison as a criminal, uh, accused of things that he hadn't done. Nevertheless, he has also seen the progress of the gospel and the church despite his personal setbacks. Imagine, he's the guy sent to the Gentiles and not long into his ministry, he goes to jail. So he's thinking, wow, I gotta get out of here. I've, you know, I'm, I'm the one bringing it to the Gentiles and I'm stuck in jail. And yet he realized despite this setback, the gospel continued to grow, continued to spread. Again, using himself as an example of a faithful servant, Paul declares that he is ready to continue suffering, even being killed while remaining faithful in order to steady and strengthen the faith of those who are chosen. So he's saying, look, I'm suffering, I'm in jail, but you know, the gospel keeps going and you people remain faithful and even if they take my life, I'll let them take my life. If in any way it'll help you to remain faithful, to see that I'm ready to go all the way. So he says to become the chosen, you know, for the sake of those who are chosen. You become the chosen when you respond to the gospel with faith expressed through repentance and baptism. Matthew 28, Acts 2, we know those passages. God chooses us by calling us through the gospel. The ones who respond, they're the chosen. It's a term the Bible uses for those who respond to the gospel. So here Paul adds the reward that all Christians will receive, not only faithful teachers, all Christians will receive the same reward, and that is salvation, of course, salvation, forgiveness for our sins, resurrection from the dead, and eternal glory with God in heaven. Now, note that, he, that Paul says eternal glory and not eternal life. That's an important distinction in that passage we just read. It suggests that our experience after the resurrection will not simply be an existence or a life after death. It suggests that it'll be something more. And Paul hints at what that might be in the following verses. So we look at verse 11, 12, and 13. He says, it is a trustworthy statement for if we died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, <clears throat> he also will deny us. 
If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. This is a good news, bad news way of summarizing the different results brought forth from faithfulness and unfaithfulness. So the good news, verses 11 and 12, if we Christians died with Him, He died on the cross, where do we die? Well, we die in the waters of baptism, right? Again, let's go over to Romans chapter 6, verse 3. In that passage, Paul says, or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into His death. We relive His death through our burial in baptism. So the good news, let's back up. If we Christians died with Him, He died on the cross, we died in the waters of baptism. If we have done that, He says we will also resurrect with Him. He was resurrected from the tomb where He was laid after His crucifixion. We on our part, we resurrect from the watery grave of baptism. Where does it say that? Well, it says that in Romans chapter 6, verse 4 and 5. He says, therefore we have been buried with Him through baptism into death. I mean, it can't be clearer than that. <laughs> you, you, there's, you don't have to make any interpretation. He spells it out. We have been buried with Him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, Him raised you know, from the tomb, so we too, might walk in the newness of life. For if we have become united with Him in the likeness of His death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of His resurrection. So what's he saying? Jesus died on the cross. He was buried. He resurrected from the tomb. We die and are buried in the waters of baptism and we come out of the waters of baptism. We are resurrect, so to speak, out of the waters of baptism, a new person someone uh, forgiven for sin and possessing the Holy Spirit. And so, <clears throat> go back to our Timothy passage. Paul is saying, if we endure, meaning if we remain faithful to our calling and the gospel and the doctrine and service, okay, then we will reign with Him in heaven. That's his point. So here's the order of our transformation beginning at lost, unregenerated sinner condemned to hell. That's where we start, okay? First, there's the regeneration. We're born again as forgiven, spirit-filled saints at baptism. John 3, John writes, Jesus answered and said to Nicodemus in this case, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? And Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. That's regeneration. We die with Christ in baptism, we're resurrected, a new person. Why are we new? Because our sins are forgiven. Because before we were devoid of the Spirit. We had our Spirit, but we didn't have the Holy Spirit. But now, now our sins are forgiven and we have the Spirit dwelling within us. That's how we are new creatures. There's regeneration. That's the, that's the first step of our transformation. The next step of our transformation, oh, excuse me, I have one other passage, a familiar one, Acts 2.38. Peter is saying to them, repent and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's what I just mentioned about resurrecting from the watery grave. Now, sins forgiven, possessing the Holy Spirit. That's the first step. That's regeneration. That's born again. All right. Second step. Second step in our transformation is glorification. Glorification, we're raised from the dead when Jesus returns and we are equipped with glorified bodies which will enable us to exist in the presence of God in the dimension of pure spirit. Watched the movie last night, First Man, the story about Neil Armstrong, you know, First Man on the Moon. And uh, anyways, it's an it interesting movie. <clears throat> Thing that I noticed, of course, and I've mentioned this before, uh, when he was in the capsule and they landed you know, the, the, the capsule on the, on the moon, 
he had the suit on and he, they put a suit on and he, you know, he, he had, the, he had the, the helmet with the two visors and he had you know, uh, uh, oxygen, oxygen pack on the back and had all kinds of his hands and gloves and he was completely sealed and covered. Uh, and then he was, you know, he climbed down the steps and he was on the moon. So he was equipped with an artificial body to enable him to survive on the moon because it doesn't have the same atmosphere as we do here. Had he not had that costume, he would have died instantly. Well, it's the same idea, the glorified body. We cannot exist in the presence of pure spirit in the fleshly body. We need a different body. The, the Bible calls it a glorified body for, for, for the sake of a term. I, I don't know what, a, you know what does a glorified body feel like or does it look like, some, I, I don't know. The Bible simply specifies that we need a different body to be able to be in the presence of, of God and they call that a glorified body. So that's the second stage of our transformation. It's called glorification. It happens when Jesus returns and so we read a passage in 1 Corinthians where Paul talks about this in some detail. He says, so also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown a perishable body. Yeah, that's our body now. It is raised an imperishable body. That's the glorified body. Okay. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. These are all terms describing the same thing. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. So it is also written, the first man Adam became a living soul, the last Adam became a life-giving spirit. However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural, then the spiritual. The first man is from the earth, earthy. The second man is from heaven. As is the earthy, so also are those who are earthy. And as is the heavenly, so also are those who are heavenly. He's comparing the descendants of Adam, you and I, the flesh, to the descendants of Christ, those with glorified bodies, and saying the two are not the same. Just as we have borne the image of the earthy, we also will bear the image of the heavenly. So there's the glorification of the body, step two of the transformation that will take place when Jesus returns. Step three of the transformation, exaltation. This is more than mere existence. Exaltation explains why we are equipped with glorified bodies in the first place. Glorification permits Christians to participate in the Godhead. So let's read a couple of passages there. In 2 Timothy 2.11, Paul says, it is a trustworthy statement for if we died with him, we will also live with him. Live where? Well, not on earth. We will live with him in the spiritual dimension because we're with him, it says. And then in Revelation 3.21 it says, He who overcomes, I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. Well, where will we be? Well, John in his vision tells us where we will be. He says, I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. We will be, the Christians will be with Jesus. But where? A lot of times we just say, well, in heaven somewhere. Well, pinpoint that, where in heaven somewhere? Well, Paul says here and John says here, we will be within the Godhead because we will be with Christ. And Christ is within the Godhead. So Jesus has enabled us to share His position in the heavens. This is the final step in our transformation and reason to remain faithful. That's the end game. 
Usually we're only preaching about glorification. Oh, I'll resurrect from the dead and I'll be glorified, yeah. And my question has always been, yeah, then what? What happens then? Well, Paul answers what happens then. Well, what happens then is we take our place within the Godhead. What happens within the God? Well, that I don't know, because I haven't found any passages that talks about that. Now that's the good news. Now there's bad news in this passage too. The bad news, verses 12 and 13, he says, if we deny him, he will also deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful for he cannot deny himself. So the consequences of being unfaithful are clearly and painfully laid out. And it's personal, it's personal. We personally reject the faith and deny Christ and become unfaithful servants, <clears throat> excuse me, or teachers, whatever. And Jesus personally denies us. And that, denies, uh, that denial causes the transformation to stop. Our souls are then relegated to suffer without Christ, frozen in the imperfect state of our sinfulness. Paul adds a postscript here that speaks to the utter futility of denying Christ as some do quite openly, quite provocatively. His point is the reality of Christ's existence and the truth of the gospel is such that a denial by man does not affect the reality and truth of his existence and position. If you deny him, it doesn't matter. He exists. He, he doesn't deny himself. Your denial of him does not eliminate him. A million people can rise up and say there is no sun in the sky, but its reality and presence is not affected by these denials. Even if 20 million people denied its presence, it would still be shining in the sky. And that's the point that Paul is making here about Jesus. You can deny all you want, as, vehement, as vehemently as you want. It cannot, <laughs> it cannot eliminate the truth of the matter that Jesus is the Son of God, and that what Paul is explaining here uh, will take place, uh, is in the process of taking place. All of us in this room are in a process of transformation, right? We're in that process of transformation. We've, we've started the first, you know, the first set. We've been born again. We've been transferred from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. We're in the process of maturing our faith and encouraging one another to remain faithful in service and so on and so forth. We're, we're at that stage and we're looking forward to the next stage which is glorification. And then the third stage, the exaltation, uh, which comes uh, afterwards. And all of those things happen, twinkling of an eye, there's no thousand years or calendar or anything like that. In the twinkling of an eye, it's all over. Jesus comes, the world's destroyed, the evil are put away, the devil is judged forever, we're caught up in the sky, glorified, transformed, exalted, boom, twinkling of an eye. So it's the same with Jesus. All the disbelief in the world has no effect on His presence, His cross, and His promises to us. So let's, uh, let's always try to remember that and let's keep that in our hearts you know, when things get rough and when it seems the people in the world are winning the battle, you know, they won't in the end, that's for sure. All right, thank you very much.